are you? My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James Bond. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British hand up, sir. Welcome to James Bond Radio. News, reviews, and discussion of all things 007. Pussy. I think you see, I have no problem with female authority. Oh, pipe down, 007. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Okay, welcome to the very first episode of James Bond Radio. I'm Tom Sears and I've got my good buddy Chris Wright. Say hello, Chris. Hello, Chris. And <laughs> I like it. And uh, and yeah, basically we're going to make a podcast and we're going to be talking about all things James Bond from everything from the movies to the actors to the books to what we like about Bond, what we don't like about Bond and pretty much everything there is to talk about really so we're gonna crack straight on so our first kind of thing is we wanted to kind of get to know each other obviously chris and i are buddies and we already know each other anyway but we wanted to get to know each other again like a beginning of a beautiful relationship for the benefit of our listeners so chris tell them a little bit about yourself oh thanks very much for that really kind introduction so much appreciated no worries um man. well i've uh, i kind of Started with Bond back in the day when the world had VHSs and DVDs were just a myth and were unknown and kind of got introduced to it through my dad who's Scottish and a bit of a uh, Connery fan and I guess watching uh, numerous films and especially the Bond films when I was younger is what kind of got me into it really. So that was it. I didn't know your dad was Scottish. That's that's kind of cool. That means you're like quite Bondy in yourself. Yeah. Well, I I kind of don't see myself as Scottish, but I'll allow myself to be that bit of Scottish because obviously Bond is Scottish, isn't he? So there you go. Yeah, you know. So that, so like for you, Bond has always been something that's like always been there since you were a kid. Yeah, definitely. As far back as I can remember, it was it's always been there. I didn't really have the uh, the benefit of the cinema screening, so that going to the cinema and seeing it, because I was kind of at that age where, um, well, the first one that I wanted to see was actually Licence to Kill, where, where I was obviously only nine years old, ten years old at the time. Yeah, I had and, the same uh, thing. I, I remember being gutted that I couldn't go to see it, because it, it was a 15, wasn't it? 15 certificate, and I, I must have been... What would it, 1989, so I would have been seven. Yeah. Well, I was, I was outside the cinema with a mate of mine who was even younger than I was, and we were like, right, come on, we're going to do this. We're going to sneak in. And uh, that didn't happen. <laughs> so then we thought, well, we're just walking, because, you know, we look 15, and that didn't work out either. So, yeah. yeah. I remember that nervousness whenever I'd try and get into films in those days where you weren't old enough and you were, like, desperate. You remember when they brought in the 12 certificate? And I remember going to see a 12 certificate movie when I was 11 and just being really nervous and like really trying to look old. It's hilarious. Yeah, I loved it. It's a bit of excitement. So what was then, so what was your first Bond movie you saw in the, in the, in the cinema? This is a crazy one because um, following obviously Licence to Kill, there was Goldeneye, a big gap and then Goldeneye. And I happened to be living in Bangkok at the time. So... I ended up watching it through pirated DVD, of all things. And no so, yeah. So my first actual cinema experience uh, with a proper Bond release was Tomorrow Never Dies. Really? Yeah. And I saw that, I think, about five times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in my, with, with my one, I, uh, I remember having a very, very vague memory of seeing The Living Daylights. So oh. I would have been five. Like that that is awesome. such a distant memory. I remember, you know, that thing when you come out of the cinema, where you, you've watched it in the day and it's the sun shining outside, and you come out and it's been all dark, and then you come out. That's the only thing I remember, and I have a very vague memory of like the um, the pre-title sequence, um, but that's it. But I know that was my first one in the cinema. But for me, it was, I suppose, just the age that we are. Like my first, what really got me was like Golden Eye. Like I was thirteen years old. And just that one, I actually went to see seven times <laughs> in the cinema, most of which by myself, um, which isn't very cool. But hey, um, yeah, and that's what like I was just at the perfect age when that came out. Um, but for me, it was like, I suppose, similar to you in the sense that like my uh, older brother was always into it. So it was just always in the house. It was just always a part of everything. And uh, and yeah, and then I just sort of I suppose I hit 13 and then became a freak for it, really. <laughs> 
I like it. It's a good description yeah. there. Yeah. But at, at least your parents had the courtesy of bringing you to Living Daylight. So I've kind of got a grudge against mine because, you know, why not? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I, I've got to be honest as well. Uh, to this day, that pre-title sequence is probably my favourite one. One of my favourites anyway, at least Living Daylight. So that's a good one. Without a doubt. It's right up there, if not the right, best. Cool. So I feel at this stage in the romance, we've got the small talk out of the way. We know a little bit about each other. Do you know what I mean? We're, it's like yeah. it's a bit like a date, this, isn't it? In the sense that we're sort of, you know, well, getting to uh, know each other all over again. Yeah, I've got a glass of wine and yeah. a candle next to me. It's so <laughs> It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I thought what we'd do is we'd like for the first episode is we just, you and I would chat. Uh, we'd kind of, uh, you know, talk about a few different uh, areas and, and, and just kind of let the listeners get to know where we're all coming from, basically. So, like, I thought we what would be a good thing to do would be to talk about each of the different Bond actors and, like, our thoughts on them, basically. So let's kick off with... Well, basically, for the benefit of our listeners, Gibbers is a friend of ours who's, who's probably the most... What, what word could we use to describe Gibbers... Well, a, a nice word. Um, uh, opi- I don't know. Opi- you don't have to go nice. A- opinionated. Um, opinionated. There it is. There it is. If Gibbers would hear, it was here. Gibbers would insist we start with Barry Nelson. Yeah. Who, if you don't know, was in a like a stage TV show of, of Casino Royale in 1954, but it was wasn't very good. But that's where Gibbers would insist we start. Um, and I'm that sure is because he looks on. like him. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Um, but Gibbers isn't here. We'll, we're going to get Gibbers in on, on the, in a future episode. But for now, Gibbers isn't here, so we'll uh, we'll we'll skip that and we'll start with Connery. So, Chris, how do you feel about Big Sean? Well, uh, you know, me and Sean go back a long way. Like I said, I mean, he's he's probably the first sort of movie star who I remember and the one who who I've got a huge appreciation for. Um, yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, who's your favourite Bond? It's a, it's, a, it's a big question, and it's a question that could potentially be answered within 10 seconds if everyone agreed on the same answer. <laughs> um, but, you know, you obviously have to talk a bit about it and uh, and say why that might be, and there's varying opinions as to who may be or may not be the best Bond. Um, for me personally, I think Sean has to be right up there. I think... Um, Sorry. From, with, with my take on it, like I think there's things I do love about him. There's things I don't particularly mm. like, and I think it does vary from from movie to movie. Yeah. Like if you look at like the last, well, definitely the last one. You look at Diamonds Are Forever, and he's not interested. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't give it. He doesn't. Pardon my French, but he doesn't give a shit about what's going on. He's just like phoning it in, isn't he? And just kind of going through it. So when you look at that, it's like you can't you can't judge it based on that. But at the end of the day he is just the coolest dude in like those early sort of like say the first four movies I would say he's just like he's just got it in spades and there's no competing with that no matter what anybody does no that is completely it I mean he's he's probably the coolest person to have been on cinema you know he's got the look he's got the moves he's got the the, you know his his talk his accent his everything is just spot on and I think uh yeah, it's interesting how you do judge it because I completely agree with you about um, diamonds, and I think it started a bit with "You Only Live Twice" as well. Yeah, um, that's for me. That's where you first see the sort of the boredom and the frustration of it coming yeah. out. I think. Yeah, so it's interesting. If you're talking about bonds, do you do you take the whole view? Do you take every single p- bond picture that I've been in and analyze it all, or do you say, "Well, this is." when they're at their best and just go by that it's tricky do you know what I think that's a good question and I think that's probably what you have to do is look at their absolute best and compare them from that because everybody's got a good and a bad day do you know what I mean and yeah. it, it's you, you've got to judge it based on what, what the best what the best is I suppose really but uh, okay so for you then when it comes to Sean what's your best Sean movie and what's your worst Sean movie I think we both um, know the answer to that last uh, bit yeah well it, funnily enough with me and, and the Bond films they do tend to change in order not hugely like the top five is generally the top five you know top ten worst five you know they're all generally the same but they do chop and change Yeah. Uh, currently for me with Sean um, it has to be uh, from Russia with Love ah, um, interesting yeah when I was young it was Thunderball and that was my dad's favourite Bond film and that's probably the Bond that I've watched more than any other and and I still love Thunderball and it's brilliant but From Russia With Love I just think has got a perfect script it's pretty flawless 
It's got some of the best villains, probably the best henchmen in the series. Um, and, you know, Bond's still a detective. He still, he still, he still sort of does his spying. And uh, I, I don't know, it just feels complete as a film to me. It just doesn't feel as if there's anything wrong with it. And, and uh, yeah, I just love it. Red For me, Grant's that one is, is like, that almost feels like a thriller, that movie, rather than... The, the sort of the, the formulaic Bond thing that it then became there's there's still that element of it being like an espionage thriller yeah t- definitely definitely yeah. okay so that's your favourite Sean and then yep. your least favourite well it might have been mentioned once or twice although we could bring in another film into that Never Say Never Again if we oh hey I didn't think about that yeah no, good point but... I don't know what's worse actually what do you think <laughs> okay that's an interesting point what's worse Diamonds Are Forever or Never Say Never Again bear if in mind I'm... I haven't seen Never Say Never Again in, in a good 10 years probably if I'm completely honest Never Say Never Again is head and shoulders above Diamonds oh, even, interesting yeah even though it's not an Eon Bond and you know it has it is a rip off of Thunderball and it's not as good as Thunderball Diamonds I just watched reasonably recently and I uh, I felt cringeworthy for sort of the wrong the wrong ideas the wrong feelings really I think I think that's an interesting thing because I was uh, like for me and we'll talk about this in a minute but like I think my favorite bond at this moment is on a Majesty's Secret Service and there's that there's that thing that we missed out on something there in the sense that if they'd have made like the sequel to that which would have been Diamonds Are Forever with George and that kind of thread had carried on like I wish I could see that film I would love to see that film but obviously it wasn't meant to be but there is that thought of like that sort of silly comedy slapstick vibe that was Bond for like the next decade that's what people obviously wanted at the time that's what they were into so had it gone down that route like maybe that could have been the end of Bond because if they were going the gritty gritty way back then maybe that's what people went into you know that's very true and I mean and although there's a lot wrong with Diamonds there's a lot to be t- taken for it in terms of bringing Connery back you know we might have had an American Bond if Connery didn't come back and that would have just changed the series completely yeah yeah um, absolutely you know Okay, he might not have been his best, but I still would have preferred a Connery Bond not quite at his best to keep it British and to keep that thing going rather yeah. than bringing in an American or, or whoever else they might have had in mind. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point and I think that's something, you know, there's no, we, there's no element of, of, of American racism going on here, but at the same time, I never ever want that to happen. No. I never want to see an American one. <laughs> it just does not feel right at no. all. Well, they yeah. had Barry Nelson back in the TV one. Oh, Jimmy Bond. Jimmy Bond, and I think that's, you know, one is enough, one is enough. All right, okay, so for me, I think my, uh, with Sean, I think my favourite Sean movie, uh, I, I was always a massive Goldfinger fan, I really was, and I remember you saying recently when you rewatched it that you were like, oh, I'm not that into it anymore and kind of stuff, and when you think about Goldfinger, Basically, you've got to think of how inept he is in that film mm. as 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 a spy. Everyone yeah. that comes close to him gets killed. You know, you've got the golden girl at the beginning, like both of the Master Sist- Masterson girls, they, they end up dead. Like, he goes to scope out Goldfinger's base, he gets captured, he tries to escape and, like, crashes the car and just everybody dies and like basically <laughs> and basically at the end like it's not even him that stops the Fort Knox thing you know it's like he's chained up to the bomb he doesn't even defuse the bomb he's done nothing of value through that entire movie really when yeah. you think about it um, but I suppose when you when you look at it it's like that's like the iconic one isn't it I mean there's so much in that that's just cinema gold um, no pun intended so it's kind of like I don't know it's it's a tricky one there's just so much to it that's like legendary but at the same time it's sort of it's, a, it's an odd one that so I'm I'm not sure I think for me probably my my joint favourites would be Goldfinger and Thunderball and I think those are the big two for me um, in terms of worst and I didn't take Never Say Never Again into account and I probably won't because I haven't seen it for ages um, but it's got to be Diamonds Are Forever for me like Blofeld and Drag <laughs> you know it's just I, what I will say is I do love the soundtrack to that that's a wicked soundtrack yeah. and, the, and the song but in terms of an actual movie I'm like it's not really up there for me that one no no but, although funnily yeah. enough there was a bit um, which I saw 
on the internet not long ago which was saying about diamonds and someone said yes yeah, their favorite favorite bond film so there is a bond film out there for everyone no matter what everyone thinks about this bond film or that bond film every single bond film it will be a favorite for someone out there yeah that's true i think that's the beauty of it isn't it is there is always everybody always has a conflicting opinion of what their favorite is you know you either love sean or roger or if you don't like roger you like tim or whatever but uh, but yeah, so have you have you got uh, what, the thing with diamonds? I learned recently actually is that the way they lured him back was they basically said to Sean, "Look, we'll give you this humongous paycheck." I, I can't remember exactly how much it was, but it was huge at the time. And uh, and they said basically, "We'll make any, you can make any movie that you want afterwards." So it's like he just gave him ultimate control. So it's like, why wouldn't he do that like one more time? And then he's got like ultimate creative freedom, which is, which is kind of why you see how bored he is in that performance. I suppose, because he's <laughs> yeah. just literally in it for the money. Um, but uh, but yeah, okay. So let's move on then. What about yeah. George? How do you feel about Big George? Um, well, George, 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 George is a good guy. George, <laughs> George is a is is a fighter. George is got the arrogance. The cockiness. He's um, he's got his way with women. He's good, good on the skis. I think, you know, he's slated too much in my opinion because he is. I still think every every Bond has their day, and like every Bond film, everyone's got a fan for. Every James Bond actor, you know, everyone will have their favorite James Bond actor, and it and it will be each of them. Uh, someone will be a favorite for each of them, and with George, he he does get slated too much, in my opinion. I th- I th- well, Only Majesty is is the best, if if not one of the best films, the Bond films, and um, you know, you can't say that he doesn't bring anything to that film because he does. You know, if I if think he, my my take on that is that like. I see where people are coming from in the sense that you've gone from Connery, who is like the ultimate, to this dude who's never acted before. And it's like the pressure is, is immense. And I think when I watch that movie, and again, I think I think it's my favourite Bond film, at least today it is anyway. I'll, I'll go that far and say today it is my favourite Bond film. But when you think about it, it's like there's something he brings to that that Connery could never have done. Like, I, I often thought when I was a kid, I was like, man, I would love to have seen Honor Majesties with, with Sean in it. But when I think about it, that scene at the end where, you know, spoiler alert, like his wife dies. Um, <laughs> um, like, I can't imagine Sean handling that in the same way. I think that would have had to have been rewritten for him. Like, I just can't see Connery's Bond, like, in the car like that, looking so mm. forlorn, you know. And I yeah. think... Like, I, I, you know, he is wooden. Like, this is the first time he's ever acted. A lot of his one-liners are a bit like, oh, the delivery on that wasn't great. But he's perfect for that film, I think, is is the way to look at that. Um, I, yeah, I completely and, agree. There's yeah. you, you couldn't imagine Sean doing the sort of love montage through the park and, mm. you know, all of that sort of stuff. And even the proposal, I mean... You know, George was amazing in that scene. He really was. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point. Actually, I think there's, I suppose there's like a sensitivity to his Bond that that Sean just never would have. He was just like the Superman Bond, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think he gets a lot of unnecessary flack, and I think part of the problem was I actually saw a screening of Honor Majesty's uh, last year, and George did like a little Q and A before the movie started, and um, the the. Th- the sort of impression I got was he was just like basically a dumb kid at the time like he just lucked out massively yeah. um, like probably the most lucky man on the planet to, to <laughs> score that job and he just wasn't equipped to deal with all the all the expectations and, and, and all the rest of it that came along with it um, but I think like I think given another couple of tries he could have he could have really like settled down and got more confident with it and he could have been great but whether that was what the audiences at the time wanted, I suppose that's a different story. Well, even Cubby Broccoli said so. He, he, and Peter Hunt, obviously the director of Honor Majesties, both of them said that George would have made a great Bond if he'd stayed on for, you know, one or yeah. two more. But yeah, things he happen. was uh, he was full of funny stories at that Q and A. Actually, like it's it's if you ever get the chance to like see him see him in that setting, it was like hilarious. Like some of the stories he had. 
um, one of which was uh, he, him and Diana Rigg had a little, they had an arrangement basically where she said to him that, you know, we can, we can be more than friends provided you don't, uh, you know, play around with any of the other girls on set. So he said, okay. And then he said the problem with that was that on one day when she arrived at set, the car pulls up and she gets out and he's in a tent on set, basically, um, you know, with one of the one of the ladies. And um, and as luck would have it, some one of the guys didn't realize and like pulled the tent down to get some of the equipment that was inside. And she saw everything going on inside the tent. And he said they didn't get on well after that point. Uh-huh. So that's, that was uh, that's, that's an interesting funny. introduction. I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, so uh, so yeah, I, I suppose we can't do the best George film and worst George film because he only ever did one. So well, that's true. Yeah, his best and his worst. Yeah. Okay. So I think this one, this next one, might be might divide some of the fans and listeners. Roger Moore, Chris, yeah. how do you feel? I feel that he was perfect for the time, as has been quoted a million times before. But it's true. I think his films were needed. The films that were there. And I think he's he's got a big spectrum from in terms of the actual films that he's done. They cover quite a few different sort of areas. You know, you've got the fantasy ones, you've got the down to earth ones, you've got the humorous ones. So you know, he he brought a lot to the role. I think when I was younger, I always tend to compare Bond from what I thought when I was young and what I think now. And yeah. uh, when I was young. I used to really enjoy the Roger Moore films. There were one or two I wasn't sure about. And as I've grown o- older, certain certain Roger Moore films have, have crept up the sort of scale, definitely, and then one or two of them haven't. But, um, yeah, you know, I think, he, I think he was great. He's Obviously, he's English, and that's brilliant because we yeah. hadn't had one of those before. Um, and, you know, he definitely bought... The charm is there. He's... You, it's you know you've got to know how to take him because you do get the cheese with Roger Moore. You get a lot yeah. of the cheese, and some people just don't like cheese. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, there is that. Yeah, there is a lot of cheese there. But if you if you if you're you know if you can live with that and um, or you know bring bring that in his stride, then uh, there's a lot to be gained from Roger Moore. I think something I've thought about in recent times is you remember how strange it was when they first cast Daniel and it was like what the hell is going on here and they had that awful press conference where he had his like blonde curtain haircut and just he didn't seem interested he was giving these awful answers and obviously there was all the press backlash and it was like I remember thinking shit this is this is over this is going to be an absolute disaster (laughs) and then obviously it wasn't it was bloody brilliant but like there's that thing of, of of something being drastically different to what you're used to yeah, and then and then I remember when I first saw Casino, I was like, I came out of it and I was like, I don't quite know what to do with that. It's it's so different. I don't know. Do I like it or do I not like it? I don't know. Went home, thought about it for for a day, came back, watched it again the next day, and was like, actually, that's the best thing I've ever seen, uh, barring on a Majesty's Secret Service. They're joint yeah. first for me anyway, which we'll talk about later. <laughs> but I think you compare Connery in From Russia with Love or Doctor No to Roger in Octopussy. And I mean, you cannot get more different. It's like, it's it's just, it's still Bond, but it's not, it's very different. Mm. So I suppose it's like how, how you take that. And I often wonder like what Fleming would have thought about Roger's performance. Like would, there's there's that certain upper class nature of Roger, which Fleming would have probably loved. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, they, does he have that sort of, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking, that sort of sense of menace about him. Do you know what I mean? That dark side, he does not have a dark side at all. No. Um, so yeah I don't know for me I love Roger but I, I put him in context of the times where like I mean could you imagine Roger in Honor Majesty's Secret Service I mean that would just be that's an interesting awful, one <laughs> like I just can't see that happening at all yeah um, you know could you imagine Roger I suppose like you look at For Your Eyes Only for example you got the famous scene at the end where he kicks the car off like that's I, I would put that as Roger's license to kill moment do you know what mm. I mean but I can't see it ever going any more than that. No. Um, but in terms of, of I, I love him like an uncle. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah. like, I want to give him a cuddle and, <laughs> and listen to some of his stories. But do I want to be him? Maybe not. No. Do you know what I mean? That's I think how that, I, I, that's a really good way of putting it, actually. He is more, yeah, if you aspire to be a Bond, so, so 
if you could be any Bond sort of actor while well, they were Bond, I mean, you know, I think you've put the nail on the head with Rog. You, you, you'd happily be good mates with him almost and, or, or, you know, feel like, a, you know, come on, Rog, just go for a drink and, and get the ladies. But, um, yeah. yeah, you know, I think one or two of the others you'd probably aspire to more yeah. in the character of Bond. But then again, with, with Rog, like... Sometimes you just got to have a, a Rog Bond film on, you know. Oh you, yeah. You just, you know, you just got to because there's so many good ones as well, and and you know you're in a different frame of mind for different sort of ways that you feel, isn't it? I think for me, there's like in terms of like best movie, worst movie. For some reason, I've just got an affinity for Live and Let Die. I just, I just, I dig that movie in a big way. Um, and I actually watched it three times back to back recently where I watched it as normal and then I watched it with the first uh, commentary track the director's commentary and then I watched it again with it, it was it was the director and then it was uh, Tom Mankiewicz the writer for the other yeah. one so I just watched it I like did a blitz and I don't know <laughs> there's just something about that, that I love I love the soundtrack I love the yeah. uh, the theme song I just love everything um, apart from maybe Kananga inflating at the end <laughs> that could have been taken down a touch but hey it was the yeah. times um, <laughs> But that, so that for me is my favourite. Um, I think probably most people would say Spy Love Me being their favourite. But for me, that that sort of getting, I do love it, but it's a bit getting into the cartoony territory for me. That one, um, like even Jaws is 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 a bit like when you can com- like compare put Jaws in from Russia with Love. It's just ridiculous, isn't it? It's a completely different world. It's like the comic book Bond, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Um, least favourite. I'll be honest, and you actually changed this for me. I would have <laughs> always said Moonraker, but then last time you came down, remember we watched it, and yeah. I was like, actually, that's nowhere near like what I remember. All I re- ever remembered was like the spacesuits and the lasers and all that, all that nonsense. But like the first two thirds of that movie yeah. is great. It's there's great bond. It's in awesome, it. yeah. Um, yeah, but I, <laughs> you get to the end and you've got the well, here's to us, and it's yeah. like, come on, <laughs> like don't do yeah. that. Um, <laughs> So I, I don't I don't know what my worst one is yet. I, I'm I've, I'm kind of going to work my way through the later Rogers. I suppose the later Rogers I haven't watched in a long time. Um, I've I've never really been able to get along all that well with a view to a kill simply because he's so old. He was like 58 years old, and it was just come on, man. That's 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 too far. That should have been Tim's movie or Pierce's movie even at that point. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I, I I don't know what my worst Roger is. I would say if I had to choose one to watch now. The one I probably would be least interested in watching would be for your eyes only. I think. Mm. That's interesting. Um, How about yeah. you? Um, well, with my favourite, that's changed quite a few times actually. Ooh, yeah, that's interesting <laughs> because, well, I, I might go through them if uh, and then and then get my answer after. So, live and let die. That was one which has actually grown on me a lot since I was young. When I was young, it used to scare the shit out of me, scare, oh, yeah. the, scare the crap out of me for certain scenes. Which, That's which, okay. You, I, I feel like we can swear on this podcast. Can we? Fine. Well, I, yeah, I think yeah. we can. I think yeah. we can. Okay. I mean, let's not go too far. Let's not bring out the big ones, but we can we can say the well, we can, word, I think. If the emotion runs high, we can, we yeah. can go there. Um, yeah, so the thing I love about that film is it's got so many villains, henchmen and, and, and all of that sort of stuff, which I loved. And uh, it's definitely come up in my estimation um, compared to when I was younger so that that's up there but it's not my favourite I'm going to skip Man with the Golden Gun I'll come back to that uh, okay. Spy Who Loved Me now that one strangely was one that I found to be a bit overrated when I was younger compared to a lot of people because everyone okay. used to go yeah it's my favourite I love it and all this and I, and I remember the scenes the car the obviously the opening uh, cliff jump scene and all that and it was good but I always actually found quite a few of the other ones to be better but I have recently watched it, and it is a really good film. There's a lot going for The Spy Love Me, a lot. And, uh, and that's definitely up there, but I don't think it is my favourite at the moment. Um, Moonraker, like you, like uh, the first two thirds are amazing. They're really good. Like Drax, what a villain, an awesome yeah. villain. It's so cold and, and cold-blooded. He's such a good villain, but... Um, you know, obviously everything else that happens sort of in the late, latter part of the film is a bit dodgy. Yeah. Um, when I was young, Few Eyes Only was probably my worst Roger Moore. Um, now, 
I don't think it it's is. It's a bit like, of a slow movie, that one, I think, yeah, isn't it? That's yeah, the, that's the only trouble with it. It's got some good scenes, but it is slow. It could even be uh, uh, the slowest Bond, maybe. I don't know. I, think, know. I think there's... I, what I do like is seeing that previously unused Fleming material, like the, the thing at the end with hanging on the back of the yacht and dragging, <laughs> dragging them over the coral and stuff. That's yeah. great. But, yeah, I don't know. There's something missing in that one for me. But I, I used to be a big fan of that when I was a kid. I, I don't know what's changed there, but, no. yeah, I guess... For whatever reason, I, it, it's like it's always the last one I'd put. On. No, that's not true. The last no. one I'd put on is Die Another Day, but it's the <laughs> yes. last, the least of Rogers that I would put on. <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll skip Octopus and go on to A View to a Kill. Now, with that, that's actually got a lot going for it as well. Again, it's a strange sort of thing where if I could, a lot of the Bond films, I want to, I want to edit them myself. There's little yeah. bits that I want to take out or move around to make them better. Die another day, you can take a whole five minute chunk out of that film and it would be far better for it. But anyway, we won't yeah. go there just yet. With that, that's you, a whole episode there, isn't it? That is a whole that episode. One. There, <laughs> that, yeah. episode yeah. that is a whole episode waiting to happen. Um with View, I think um again, great villain, good good story, good scenes. But the San Francisco section just doesn't do it for me. The whole fire truck, the the flames the character of Stacey Sutton and when she's screaming, it just really pisses me off. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think with that, like for me, there's 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 like a a Bond element in in certain things. Like for example, I mean, going back to Honor Majesties again, just every section of that mo- movie just sort of oozes Bond appeal. There's no other way I can say it. Yeah. But there's there's a lot of things, and especially later on with with to some extent, the Tim movies, and definitely with the Pierces, is where they sort of felt like generic action movies. There wasn't that Bond feel. And I no. think it's interesting you say that. I think that, that San Francisco sequence is very much like that could have been a diehard Bruce Willis movie, that, that, that part of the film. There's nothing inherently Bondian about it. You know what no, I mean? No, no. But having said that, everything before... I think is amazing in that film. I really like it. I like it. Do you a know lot. what my favourite part of that is? I like the bit where the car goes in the river and then he, he sucks the air out of the tyres. It's Superb. that like ingenuity. It's like, yeah. yeah man, that's cool. That's like a that's a thinking outside of the box moment. Yeah. I love that. Brilliant, brilliant bit of the film. Yeah. Um so yeah, that leaves me with two films, one of which is my favourite Roger Moore, one of which is my least favourite Roger Moore. Oh, interest. Uh, this is interesting because I know the two you've skipped, and I know which one your favourite is. So I yeah. didn't know this was your least favourite. But go on, carry on. So, so I'll start with. Well, I'll go straight with my. I'll go with my favourite, um, which is Octopussy, and it has been probably for a long time now. Um, I think it's got some of the best suspense scenes in the whole of of uh, Bond series. I think it's probably got, along with the Living Daylights, the best opening pre-title sequence. When it cuts into the forest with the clowns chasing, uh, when he's being chased, when he's dressed up as a clown, 009, that's amazing. The Sotheby scene, it's got India, it looks lovely. Uh, the vi- the main villain, Kamal Khan, he, he's okay, he's not one of the best villains. He's not the most memorable, should we say. He's good as a villain, but he's not sort of, you know, he's not one that you think of when you think Bond villain. But I just really like it. There's, um, I, I, it just. Yeah, I think it's great. I really do. Um, he, I, I think, know. Sorry, go on. No, I was going to say he, he is a he is a little bit old. He's um, there are one or two bits in it that I'm still not sure about. But um, as as one that I'd happily watch more than any other, I would put Octopussy as my first for Roger. I think going back to that point, we we're just talking about about something feeling like Bond rather than just a generic action movie. I think there's a lot in there and I haven't seen this one in a while actually but like you know the, like the, the 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 egg auction the Fabergé egg auction and stuff um, and there's just I don't know there's a sense of class to that kind of sequence yeah. do you know what I mean it's like Definitely. Bond goes into M's office it's got the leather studded door um, mm. and and then it's like onto the onto the auction it's like yeah that's like classic Bond that's a classic Bond setting even though that auction that sequence mm. isn't very long Um like for me with that one it's like there's some iconic stuff in there you've got the the acro star jet at the beginning mm, which is like yeah. that's a classic bond thing um i do love and i wish they would do this more i do love seeing the other double o's even if it's just them getting killed at the beginning there's just something about like you never see that world of the other double o's do you it's just bond and that's it um so that's cool i think for me 
Yeah, I, 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 you know, it's back in those days when the Russians were the bad guys, and there's, there's that, there's that sort of like that sort of harks back to Smirsh and all that kind of stuff. Um, for me, I, the, the thing, I, I suppose, the one thing that puts me off the movie is the clown suit. Do you know what I mean? I'm just like, ah, oh, that's sort of <laughs> just, just too far for me personally. I, do you know what I mean? You, you wouldn't see Daniel do that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see Sean do that. The uh, only no. one you would ever see do that is Roger. You know, that's, that's yeah. his unique ability. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> he can wear a safari suit one scene and a clown yeah. suit the next, and yeah. yeah. But yeah. again, you know, you got to take these films in the context of the times in which they were made. So it's like that was that was what was going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. So that, so that's your favourite. Have you got anything else to say about Octopussy? Because if that's your favourite, you can you can probably you can probably go for a while on on that. One. Yeah, I probably could do. I think I, I mean it would be good to analyse the films in a bit more detail, sort of in later podcasts. But um, yeah. yeah, it's just I just think the India section is. Fact, you know it looks it looks lovely and yeah there's a lot there there's a lot there that we can we can I tell go back what, to you know what thinking about that we, we should definitely do a, an individual episode for each movie at some point but yeah. do you know what one of the coolest moments is and it gets in that film like for me that is like typical like oh man I want to be I dude. know exactly what scene you're going to say okay all right can okay, I guess can I guess it, well let, let me uh, uh, all right. oh, yeah all right okay go d- on. does it involve two dice ah, yeah, that's exactly it <laughs> that's good yeah. yeah i love it i love that bit it, for the benefit of our listeners there's a thing where he rolls the dice and he doesn't even look he doesn't even look to check and he's like double sixes fancy that and it's just like oh man if i was in that position i'd have to have a little look i'd have yeah. to just check yeah but he doesn't because he's too cool I love he's that too section. cool for school yeah, that stuff. is brilliant yeah. so right, yeah cool. so that leaves me with the man with the golden gum. Now this is interesting because this is actually one of my my higher rated ones. So I'm interested to see what what it is you don't like. About. When, when did you last watch it? Do you mind if I ask? Um, it was a while ago. To be honest with you, a lot of the Rogers I haven't seen for several years, and and I've just picked up the uh, the Bond Fifty box set so I can revisit a lot of these. So oh, I haven't seen it for a long time. But but yeah, go go ahead. Shoot. Okay. Well. I'll start with the good things. Uh, Christopher Lee, Scaramanga, yeah. amazing. The Golden Gun, I loved it. The whole sort of ingenuity behind it and everything. Um, Nick Knack, he was, you know, he, he was good. He had his, uh, he had his fun bits. Um, I think uh, overall, I just found it to be the weakest of the Rogers. Um, mainly, well, I didn't think Mary Goodnight was that strong a character. Um, I've just I, got to step in there, and I I agree with you. She's right. not a strong character, but yeah. she does have some other things going for her that I find very very appealing. Yes. That's all I'm going to say. Carry on. Okay, thanks for that one. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, the, it just seemed to be like, for instance, boat chasing, live and let die, brilliant. Boat chasing, man with a golden gun, meh meh. There's a lot of scenes where it's just a little bit, meh, it's not quite, yeah. it's not quite hitting, hitting the button. The kung fu scene where he comes out and then the girls beat up the guys instead of him. I mean, actually, no, I mean, that's not too bad. The main things that, that sort of get me with that film are, are the questions where you have to ask why. Why, uh, when after Gibson was shot by Scaramanga and um, Lieutenant Hip takes him back to uh, uh, MI6 HQ in the... In yeah. the uh, Queen Elizabeth why yeah. doesn't he tell him why as soon as he's got him in the car or on the boat why doesn't he say oh by the way Bond we're going to see MI6 why that's a good point that's a good point and uh, funnily enough I saw a thread on the um, MI6 forum recently where somebody was saying that um, there's just a lot of inexplicable stuff that happened yeah. in that film that just what's the point why, why does that yeah. even happen like that bit where it's where it's take Mr. Bond to school and then there's the escape. Yeah. Why does Hip drive off? Like why does he do that? Like he, he, it's purely but, to facilitate the fact that he's gonna jump in a little boat and, and race off. Well, Bond basically had his hand on the on the car door almost and they yeah. drove off. And it yeah. you just there's just you know, it's just basically that boils down to lazy script writing. And uh, that that's something which really stands out for me. Um with in particular with the man with the golden gun so yeah there's there's more that now i could got, go on I've, about but i've got a question for you about this because okay. i know you used to own a golden gun i did 
So there's 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 something to be asked about that. If that is your least favorite Roger, like there there I mean the Golden Gun is an iconic thing. So what what is it about that that made you go? Do you know what? I'm going to buy myself a Golden Gun. Well, it's awesome. It looks great. I just like the idea of the fact that it's you know a pencil, a cigarette lighter, uh, a cuff link, and a cigarette case put together. It's like the, the one probably my favourite scene from Mamma Gone Gun is when uh, Scaramanga is getting a telling off from High Fat when he uh, when he sort of is in High Fat's um, uh, place in Bangkok. And without high fat knowing, he's slowly putting the gun together, knowing exactly what he's about to do. Yeah. You know, he's t- he's taking some abuse, but he knows what's coming. And uh, and then high fat realizes it when it's too late. The gun is put together, and bang! It's bye bye high fat that's sticking actually in the mausoleum. Cool, yeah. I, I, that's that's it. Do you know what? I've always thought Scaramanga is like the only sort of villain who sort of is a physical challenge and sort of almost as clever as Bond himself. Do you know what I mean? It's like he he that that that's a good point actually with that scene of just I remember him just sitting there calmly just putting the gun together screwing it and just listening away, and then bang, and it's that's almost like the dark side of Bond, isn't it? That's the sort of thing Bond would do. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, obviously spun on its head. So yeah, I mean, I think I'm gonna need to watch that one again because it's maybe it's one of those things that like you. I remember when I rewatched um, The World Is Not Enough. I think that was when you came down as well. I think we watched that one, didn't we? Yeah. And. Um, and you just forget how cheesy some of the, the dialogue is and stuff like that. And uh, it's like, you know, again, like taken in the context of the time, it was like you don't notice that stuff. But then when you revisit 10, 20 years later, it's like, ooh, that, that's probably yeah. a bit rough. Um, yeah. So so maybe I do need to I do need to rewatch that. I think uh, purely for the pleasure of of, uh, of seeing Mary Goodnight running around, if, if nothing else. I mean, she doesn't have to say anything. Just Just be there, you know? That's how I feel about Mary Goodnight. Yeah, maybe if she didn't say anything, it might. Have been <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So that's 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 Roger. Next one. Now I've got a lot to say on this next one. How do you feel about Tim? I am a fan. I think he's. I think he's great. Um, I know some people who, you know, say that he's the best. I know other people that say he's not even worthy of being a Bond. Um, base for me, both of his films. In particular, Living Daylights uh, 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 have got some amazing, amazing bits in them. I think uh, I know everyone says about Tim and he can't do the humour and, and whatever, but his scripts weren't laced with humour. I mean, the Living Daylights, he's got the scene with the Aston Martin and he's got a few one-liners there, but he just pulls him off all right for me. I don't think I don't think I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, I've had a few optional extras installed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's good. Salt corrosion, you know, all that yeah. sort of stuff. But no, no. In all honesty, I think I think he's good. I think um, I, there's not a bad Bond in my books. They're all good at doing their thing because they're each different. Um, in terms of his films, I mean, uh, I think Licence to Kill actually gets slated a bit too much for me. I th- conversely, with some of the other films, in fact, with The Living Daylights. Uh, if I could merge the first half of The Living Daylights with the second half of License to Kill, I'd have a top five Bond film, I'd say, easily. Because, Interesting. Yeah, because The Living Daylights, I mean, the opening sort of scenes, again, like you mentioned before, the pre-title is probably the best in the series. The scene at the Blade and Safe House with Necros and exploding milk bottles, I mean, that's that's stunning. You've got the Aston Martin on the lake and, and all the stuff that that does. The, obviously, yeah. the cello chase. Um... I, I think it's right up there. Towards the end of Living Daylights, when it gets into the whole sort of Russian-Afghan uh, battle going on, it kind of loses it a bit for me. It's still good. It's still a big epic scene, but I'm not as taken in as others. License to Kill... Oh, it has some really good bits and it has some really annoying bits. I tell you what, let's, let, let me just step in and talk about yeah. it there for a second before we go to License to Kill. I think with that, because obviously uh, most people know the story of obviously that should have been Pierce's film it's like he was cast and then the TV contract with Remington still pulled him out and Tim was the man that stepped in at the last minute so the way I see like Living Daylights is is that that was written for Pierce basically yeah um, and and again I, I do like that pre-title sequence is like one of my favourites If it might even be my favourite I'm not sure at this point but um, 
that's just awesome that's wicked i think the problems i have with living daylights is it does slow up towards the end like like you say when it gets into the afghan part and and you've got the you know the big plane and all that kind of stuff mm. i don't know there's just something about that i could i can't put my finger on it but there's just something about that that's just like meh. it's sort of like you know that's when you start looking at your watch and maybe sort of you know your mind wanders a little bit um and I think there's a, but there's a lot of class in there. There's like a lot of classic Bondian stuff. I mean, have you ever seen the photo of the of the deleted sequence they have where he like rides the magic carpet to yeah. chase in Morocco? <laughs> like, I'm so glad they cut that bit out. Yeah, you know what I, I mean, am. that's that's that, yeah. they're, they're still thinking Roger there. You know what <laughs> I mean? That's that's not good. But I think, and I, I was always in two minds about the cello chase. But I think I think that pushes it a little bit to the limit. But I think at the same time, it is, there's there's a there's a bit of Bondian class in that as well. Um, I, I I feel I don't know. There's something about that movie, even visually, the way it looks, like the colours used, that it's just it it sort of just feels a bit different. Do you know what yeah. I mean? There's something about it that's just uh, maybe a little bit off. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I think some of the 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 stuff in there like you say the milk bottles that to me that's like an iconic bond villain right there you know that's up there with rosa Klebb's shoe and all that yeah. kind of stuff exploding milk bottles um the sequence on the lake with the skis that's all great um and i remember the teaser for that i remember being a kid and seeing like the the teaser on tv and they played the, the car chase up to the point where he drives into that big shed and then they paused it and it was like oh what happens after he drives into the shed you know and it was like <laughs> massive suspense uh, i love all that stuff my problem with timmy is that it, it's like I don't want to be Tim. Mm. When Tim walks into a room, I don't believe that all the ladies in the room are turning around and nine him up. I just don't believe it. No. Um, and it, he, he, there's just that sort of, that charisma I think he lacks. And that for me is one of the most appealing things. I mean, look at Connery's charisma. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, you just want to be that dude. I don't want to be Tim, you know? Uh, don't get me wrong. I feel somewhat guilty saying that. It's like, you know, I love him. But at the same time, it's like, if I have to, lay it all out that's sort of how i feel and i think I, for for me tim is actually probably my least favorite bond as much as it tears my heart to say i have a least favorite but yeah that's i think you know i like the harder edge brilliant i love that stuff and he's good in the action scenes but just that 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 sort of charisma is like the key ingredient for me i think and that's just something he lacked i don't know how you feel about that definitely with the charisma i mean without a doubt uh, Case in point, actually, that bit where he, where where he goes, "Are you calling me or horse's ass?" And it's just like, <laughs> yeah, Tim, I, come yeah, on, mate, you can. No, that is that's definitely. That. I I think without a doubt, if you if okay, the be, if you have to look at Bond in terms of your best Bond is who you'd aspire to be most. Yeah. Then that turn makes things a lot easier, and yeah. from that point of view, he. I think he probably he definitely wouldn't be up there basically put it that way yeah. again he, he I totally agree with you about if okay have all six Bond actors at their Bond prime walking into a room full of women who's going to get the women yeah Sean Connery will d- probably get half of the women in the room at least anyway yeah I think a few will go to Danny Boy um, you might get a few of the old ones going to Rog uh, maybe the, some of the younger ones going to George and Timmy Boy will probably be left not he'd quite be, sure. He'd be left high and dry, wouldn't he? I, I guess that's, yeah. the, that's the thing, yeah. And uh, obviously Pierce will have quite a few as well. Quite yeah, a few I mean, of the ladies that's, like that's a good-looking dude, you know, yeah. or not, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I do I do definitely agree with you on that side of things, yeah. Okay. So, go on, I rudely interrupted when you were getting into Licence to Kill, so, so Karen, from that point, how do you feel about that one? Well, one of the... Well, sort of <laughs> probably the worst haircut I've ever seen Bond have is in Licence to Kill and uh, that, <laughs> <laughs> that's in the casino that's the, uh, scene that's the Count Dracula comb back. <laughs> I don't know who was doing hair and makeup on that film but surely like in, in Living Daylights you know his hair wasn't too bad he had you know it looked alright the hair <laughs> the hair in Licence to Kill is probably as bad if not worse than Daniel Craig's military crew cut in Skyfall uh, and I and I dislike that yeah I'm with you on that I remember when when the first poster came out I was like of, of Skyfall I was just like oh man it, he it looks like he's got a buzz cut do you know what it's I mean just it's just too short it's just too much like, like an in army the, cut in the, in the posters for uh, 
quantum he looked the business in that he, yeah. that was like the essence of bond whereas this but i don't know whether that was part of what they were going for because he was meant to be a bit knackered and rough yeah. looking yeah maybe, and maybe yeah. maybe that's an angle they were playing but i i hope i hope uh he gets a bit of a longer yeah. a longer cut next time i right? think he will but yeah back yeah. back to timmy's barnet yeah so that wasn't that wasn't good <laughs> does, does um, this one need its own episode do you think timmy's barnet i think it should do yeah <laughs> without a doubt um now with license there's a lot I think there's a lot going for it but mainly in the second half of the film there's a bit too much DEA drug enforcement sort of lethal weapon sort of type style film yeah. early on um, I love the tank chase at the end license kill is awesome it's one of the best vehicle chases going like in terms of spectacular it's, it's right up there yeah. um, I love the way basically as soon as Bond infiltrates Sanchez's organisation is brilliant. I, I really like it from that point on. There's a yeah. there's a fight in the barrel head uh, bar which is pretty good as well. But once he once he gets in friends with Sanchez and he slowly makes Sanchez Yeah like disloyal think all of his crew are disloyal and takes them out one by one. Bond's not doing it, he's using his intelligence to get Sanchez to take them all out. And yeah, I really yeah. like that. Plus it's got the biggest scene with Q, uh Desmond Llewellyn, dear him and you gotta love Q. Yeah, you got. I mean, you got to love him, and it, and he's great in that film. He's really good. The thing that really, really, sort of pisses me off a bit is at the very end of *License to Kill*. Felix Leiter, his wife has died. His leg has been bitten off by a shark, and he's smiling on the phone to James, going, "Oh yeah, I'll be out in a week, buddy. Hope you're well." And it's like, oh, yeah. "Well, no, no, no." Your life Le- has essentially been torn apart. Yeah. And just you'll never walk again. Be you know brave. I mean? It doesn't have to finish on a high note. Look at Majesties. If you can yeah. hit them with a bit of powerfulness, go for it. That was, to me, was a bit of a gutless move at the end of Lies and to Kill. They could have That's made that. Point. And if they had made it like that, it would have been a lot higher for me. But because of that, it's, it's dropped I think it a bit. It, I think it's a funny one in the sense that there's a lot I like about it. You know, the bit where, uh, he, you know, he goes rogue, his license to kill is revoked. Um, mm. And that actually was a, the original title of the movie. It was going to be called License yeah. Revoked. But they, uh, they, they uh, well, I think it was like three out of five Americans didn't know what the word revoked meant. So they changed it, um, yeah. which is cool. I, I think License to Kill is probably a better title, to be honest. But, yeah, I think um, so. Um, the uh, yeah, so I, I, there's a lot I like about it. But there's, again, it's something about the feel of, of this one. It doesn't feel like a bond movie to me it's like it it feels more like a generic 80s action movie and when i say generic not as a bad thing but just like a lot of the action movies at that time you know like yeah. the diehards and that kind of stuff yeah um and it sort of there's it, it feel it doesn't feel like a a british made bond it feels like an american made bond do you know uh, what that's I mean? quite true actually yeah um, definitely but i do i do love the darker side stuff i love i love seeing bond on a vengeance mission i think that's great um, yeah, I do struggle to get past the haircut in the casino. <laughs> you know, he's not gonna—he's not getting anywhere with that haircut. No. Um, I don't know what they were thinking. I really uh-huh. don't know what they were thinking. But um, but yeah, there's a there's a there's a uh, there's a lot going for it. And Sanchez again, is a great villain. He is. Do you know what? I actually bumped into him in air, at an airport once, and he was uh, he was sitting there with like a. Um, like a man from Del Monte hat on, like the white <laughs> hat with the black band, and he yeah. was just sitting there in the in the departure lounge waiting for his flight, just singing opera tunes to himself. I was like, that guy's a dude, but I was too shy to go and say hello. I, I absolutely, you know, I was I regret that. I hate that, but um, yeah, I was too shy to go to say to say hello. But my girlfriend actually, she actually sat next to him on the flight and was chatting to him and got to know oh, him wow. a bit, and she told him about cool. me. So he, yeah, that, that that validates me a little bit. I feel good about that. That's but, good. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, th- I think, do you know, weirdly, when I was a kid, Sanchez was actually my favourite Bond villain, strangely enough. Wow. Like, I didn't like know now, that. looking back, I was like, well, that's kind of ridiculous, really, compared to what, what else there is there. Mm. But, um, but yeah, he, it's a good one. I like he's it. He's good. Yeah, he's good. So what would you say out of those two movies, best and worst? I would probably say, well, no, I would definitely say Living Daylight's over licence to kill. But it's just a shame that, you know half of one and half of the other is good and half of one and half of the other is not so good did did John Barry do the score for License to Kill or was that someone else? No that was Michael Kamen and he did the score for Lethal Weapon and Die Hard so that kind of got the same sort of similar feel to it the the music's very Lethal Weapon-esque in some of the scenes I think think Living Daylights is is the last John Barry score isn't it? That was it Living Daylights last Barry score yeah. yeah 
yeah that's um yeah score that's, for that's, living daylights is really good the synthesizer it is good, isn't it? it's yeah, amazing it is. bond theme for that it is mm. uh yeah that is a good one i like that a lot um Cool. Okay. So that's. Uh, you got anything more to say about Tim, or should we move on? Oh, we we can move on. We've plenty plenty of time further down the line. Okay. So I I think this is another polarizing debate. I know certainly <laughs> a lot of people have very very wide passionate views about this next bit, uh, myself included. I will be honest. So, the Irish wonder Pierce Brosnan. How do you feel? Pierce Brosnan the man. Pierce Brosnan Bond. Pierce Brosnan the Bond films. It's they're all to me different I think Pierce Brosnan as Bond I think he's I really like him I, I think he's really good I think we mentioned the look I mean you know he's a, he's a handsome chap he's got the suave down completely um, even in the fight scenes you kind of think yeah he could probably handle himself you know he's not he's he's not too bad um, he's, he can do the humour so he's got a lot of facets to him as Bond um, the thing where I think it falls for me is not Pierce's fault um, the fact he did four Bond films and I know a lot of people go on uh, about Goldeneye which I do like I think it's slightly overrated but I do like but I think he, he was a bit unlucky with the films that he was given to do as Bond I'm glad you said that and again I think what you have to do is take into account the times in which these movies were made and I, like at the end of the day Golden Eye was 20 years ago this year. It was like filmed at the end of, two, uh, of 1994. So, mm. I mean, that's, you, you compare what we expect from one now to 20 years ago, that's like comparing, you know, Octopussy to From Russia With Love. Do you know what mm. I mean? It's that, it's that same difference of time. You know, it, yeah. you know, so it's obviously because it's recent history for us, you sometimes forget that, I think. But I think you're absolutely right. That's exactly how I feel about it. That I, 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 I mean like I said before GoldenEye was like the first movie that really got me and really got me into it mm. so I have a very special place in my heart for that one but I think again going back to that sort of generic action movie thing I think with the three that came after that there was definitely that sort of just generic 90s action movie thing going on um, it's some god awful script writing sometimes you know um, and yeah. and just some just ultimate cheese I think you know if you say <laughs> Roger's cheesy I think I, I don't know whether it's more cheesy, but it's certainly up there on the cheese front, you know. Yeah. Um, like when we rewatched oh. World Is Not Enough recently, and there's that that bit at the beginning um, where he's got the glasses on, you know, the pre-tap yeah. sequence, and she's like, "Here are my figures," yeah. and he's like, "Oh, I'm sure they're perfectly rounded." <laughs> and it's just like, oh, that just feels really fucking stupid. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, that doesn't make me smile. That doesn't make me laugh. It's no. just a cringeworthy one. Yeah. You know? Um, there, there are some worse ones than that in the Brosnan films. Yeah, I, they, for me, they, they are, yeah. I know what you're going to say. This as could well. easily descend into. into I know, into, I know, I know. Yeah, it's just. It, 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 oh man, I, I know, I, I know. You know. It's tough. The, you know, Saved by the Bell and all that kind of stuff, and yeah. you know, my name is Mister Kill. Oh, yeah. I'm to die for. Shut up! Like this is ridiculous. But that isn't Pierce's fault. Like, if you look at, um, have you seen Everything or Nothing? That documentary. Yeah, 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 yeah. Brilliant. Year? Um, and he's very aware of that, isn't he? Like he was laughing about the parasailing sequence yeah. and all that oh, kind of stuff. Yeah. And he was very, aware, and he basically said, "I, I remember everything about Goldeneye, but the next three just blended into one." And I think that's that, yeah. largely how the majority of people feel. Again, I need to rewatch them. I haven't rewatched, yeah. them, especially Tomorrow Never Dies, in a long time. And I think I've still only seen Die Another Day once. Um, <laughs> Have you? Oh. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. But I think um, the thing with it is, is I think he was a great Bond. But the, just the source material he had to do with it. Like, no actor could have made that stuff sound good. Nobody no. could have done it. You know what I mean? And he just done, did the best with what he could at the time. Um, but at the same time, for me, I want to be Pierce. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I want to be him. Like, it's the same. You look at Connery in, in, in the casino at the beginning of Dr. No, and you're like, that's just the coolest motherfucker in the room. Yeah. The same thing with Pierce for me. It's like, he's just a cool bastard. And I want to be him. And I you get the charisma you get the the lady side of things i think in the action sequences he can look a bit like stiff at times um strange running strange running yeah style. strange running uh, an, an unusual pain face you know um yeah. but but other than that i you know to be honest like i look back and i i think he was the perfect man for the time in which they were made i can't think of any other actor around at that time who would have been able to do a better job i don't think um, no. excuse me um for me, I think go, like there's there is some real classic iconic Bond stuff in his movies. I think the boat chase in, in tomorrow uh, world is not enough. 
Yeah. That to me is like an iconic Bond boat chase. That's really solid stuff. I think Electra King is a, is a great villain. Um, Superb. And uh, yeah, and I think for me, Golden Eye, you've got the iconic bungee jump um, at the beginning. And I think for me, the, the, I, I love the the, the one liners in that are great. I, I do love that stuff. Like you know, that, that's because they're know, humorous as, and not just cheesy. I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like you know, like, there's a bit in the, the car chase at the beginning where she's like, you know, I love a drive as much as the next girl, and then mm. senior races past, and she's like, who's that? It's the next girl, you know. And it's like, yeah, and, and <laughs> I don't know. It's just he comes out with these lines. You're like, yeah, man. I wish I'd have said that. Like, I wish I could say something that was that cool. Yeah. Um, th- that for me only happens for Pierce and Goldeneye the other three I'm sort of like oh, you know it is it is a problem for me but um, but I do love him and because he came along at the right time for me I will always have a special place in my heart and if anybody anybody says something bad about Pierce I, I want to fight them for it you know what I mean <laughs> I want to fight them I, it's just my gut reaction it's yeah. like somebody you know um, you know dissing on your family or something you just you're like you what son you know what I mean you want to rock about it <laughs> Um, but yeah, go on. How do you feel about Pierce? Well, I think the fact he well he did re-energize it, didn't he? You know, it was six year hiatus since license, and uh, you know. It, do you know what? Actually, it, sorry to butt in again. I think I, I heard a story. I don't know how true this is, but I heard the story that in that six year hiatus there was a time when they they'd written Goldeneye for Tim to come back, and that was on the card still. But the okay. studio who financed the movie weren't convinced that Tim was the right man for it. And obviously, based on the, the receipts of his previous two movies, they basically said, we aren't going to make Goldeneye. We won't finance it unless we recast the role. And him stepping out wasn't him stepping out and saying, you know, I don't want to do Bond anymore. It was like, look, the movie's not going to get made if I stick no. around, so I have to bow out. I don't know how true that is, but no, I think no. there might be a lot of truth in that. There was a screenplay for uh, Bond 18, which was going to be set in Hong Kong, and from what I remember reading, it was something to do with like artificial artificial intelligence robots or something. Do you know what? I've got a vague memory of that as well. Now you say that, yeah. It was it was it was a strange strange sort of idea, but um, and that was with Tim in mind. Yeah. Obviously, it didn't get the go ahead, and I think that was probably around the early nineties, ninety two, ninety three, maybe. Yeah. But um, whether whether or not it was true about Tim, I think it was a right move either way. So. Yeah, yeah. It needed freshening up, and I mean, he did a bang up job. Like Goldeneye was like it reinvented everything, I think, and brought it bang up to date. I think I don't know. I think maybe had the whole thing not happened with the TV contracts and stuff, and he had been in Living Daylights, I would have loved to have seen him in Living Daylights because I think that was that would have been the right film for him in terms of tone. Yeah. Like I think he could have the humorous bits a little bit better. Not that there's much in there, but like. Like uh, when I look at that pre-title sequence, like you can see Pierce doing that in the black suit and the, the you know the parachute jump and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, it's interesting. So yeah, is it? It is interesting. But in terms of like, so what you're saying is basically you think he was a good Bond. It was just a shame about the material he had to play with. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you had to, I mean, I've got a shrewd idea. In fact, I've got a pretty really good idea of what you'd put as your favorite and your least favorite. I'll be interested yeah. to know what what order you'd put the two middle ones. Okay, so favorite Goldeneye, without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, for me, it, maybe I look at it in rose tinted specs in the sense that that was the movie that did it for me. So I'm always going to feel that about it. Um, but even now, I think that, I think it hasn't dated very well. It looks like an old film mm. compared to the others. Um, That's very true, in, actually. In in terms of like the content, I I love that. I think it's brilliant. I think the tank chase is great. Um, mm. you know uh, all that stuff um, is is bang on for me um, I think Trevelyan's a great villain I think uh, it's, again I love seeing the other double O's and it's good to see somebody who's a physical and mental match for him um, mm. I, the only thing I don't like about it is that the, you know the bike off the edge into the plane in midair taking off and all that kind of stuff yeah um, Though I do remember defending that to the ends of the earth at the time, saying, but he's trained, he can do these things. But then <laughs> I'm like, come on, like that was too much. What should have happened there is he's on the bike and he jumps into the plane just before it goes over the edge and then pulls yeah. up. 
you know yeah. the, that would have been the better way to go around things i think but basically um, so, it's all it's all down to the stunts if they can do it for real and you see it's yeah. real then he can do it if you yeah. can't and you got a cgi don't do it <laughs> I think you know. it's, it's, for me that is my underlying thing, and that's why I had a lot of problems with Skyfall. Is mm. that you know, taking the the, the 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 tidal wave typhoon thing in Die Another Day? Mm. My thoughts are: if you can't do it for real, then just don't bother. Like, mm. just don't bother. Cut that bit out because it's just ridiculous, you know. Um, and I felt a bit like that. I, I felt the CGI was glaringly obvious in Skyfall, and it, to me, whenever I see that, it's just a personal thing. It just brings me right out of it. I'm just like, oh man. Mm. Why, you, know, you, you look back in the day, they actually ran over the top of those alligators. Or were they crocodiles? I always get that mixed up. Cro- they were alligators. Yeah, they're they? probably a mixture of each. Yeah. <laughs> he actually ran over that. They actually did the spiral jumping man with the golden gun. That's that's brilliant. That's like setting the bar for stuff. That's like that's why Bond is so special is because those stuff were done for the first time. You know, the ski jump, the bungee jump, setting records every time. Mm. And then for me, it's just like, it's just lazy to just be like, yeah, we'll knock it up on a computer. It's like, what's special about that? There's there's nothing special about that at all. It might look mm. all right to some people's eyes, but for me, it's just a, it's a cop out really. Um, so I think it's glaringly obvious what my least favorite one, and this is my least favorite of all of them. This isn't just my least favorite piece. This is like the film that I, I vowed to never ever watch again. <laughs> Uh, which is Die Another Day. I think the dialogue's awful. I think the storyline is awful. I think the performances are awful. Um, I just, I I was indifferent to Madonna before this movie came out. Ever since then, I can't even look at the woman without feeling just a strong, huge amount of disgust. Um, the theme song is awful. Um, the only saving grace I think it has is that that sort of, um, I mean, oh, it, I'm not even sure if it does have a saving grace, to be honest. I knew this movie was going to be bad as soon as I saw the first production still that was released, which was Bond on a surfboard surfing into his mission. And I thought, hold on a minute, that's not, that's, who <laughs> surfs as a mode of transport? That's just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and sure enough, that whole pre title sequence was just bollocks. Like the running around on the hover, hovercrafts. It just, as you can tell, it just angers me to even think <laughs> about this film. Um, it's just ridiculous the one saving grace I think it had was the bit where they were brave where it's like he gets captured for however many months it was I think what was it supposed to be 14 months I think it was yeah, something something like that. Like that, yeah. he's got the beard and the long hair and it's like wow this is new we've never seen this before mm. and then there's the exchange and all the, all the rest of it and I thought if they'd have stuck with that angle and really tried some new stuff and, and when you read interviews from Pierce at the time he's talking like that's what the movie was going to be was that and I think I remember reading him say since then that they just lost their bottle and just went back to, you know, super formula and just going completely the opposite direction. So mm. Dying of the Day wasn't the movie it was meant to be. Mm. Um, and But yeah, I just the rest of it is just so piss poor. I, it just, I can't... It's <sighs> interesting how much it mirrors Diamonds Are Forever, a diamond satellite that blows stuff up. Yeah, that's up. true. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so go on then. Give me your two. Well, in all honesty, in in the in the short, I'm going to have to agree with you on both. Um, Goldeneye, I'm not as big a fan as some people. I think it, like, I agree with you, it has dated. I think um, certain bits of it, I don't know, they don't quite work for me. I think uh, uh, Trevelyan is a great villain. M, I think Judy Dench was a stellar casting. She's yeah. she's brilliant. She's fantastic. Um, Samantha Bond as Money Penny was good as well. Um, I don't. Yeah, it doesn't grab me quite as much, but it's got a lot going for it compared to compared to some of the other pieces. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I like it a lot. Golden Knight, I like it. I think Die Another Day. There's just I see with that. I would actually not put that as low as Diamonds Are Forever because really okay yeah. interesting. Because the, I still think there are some okay bits in it. I quite like the sword fight, you know, the fence fight that turns into a sword okay. fight. Yeah. I quite like the idea of the diamonds exploding and going into Zhao's face. I quite like the actual car chase before it goes into the ice palace, so when it's on the lake. Um, yeah. um, I quite Miranda Frost is rather tasty. I'll, um, I will definitely back you up with that statement. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's... Basically, and I know that if you removed the CG of um, uh, Halle Berry diving off the cliff and the CG of the stupid 
uh, tidal tsunami yeah. wave surfing. Tidal which wave. You, you can actually edit that five minutes out of the film and it doesn't affect the story at all. Because it's I remember got, you saying it, that before, yeah. yeah. It doesn't though, and it, and it's ridiculous. But anyway, anyway, that's an, that's another talk. So yeah, so that's definitely my worst. I, I do love the random guy on the skidoo just out there on his own in the middle of nowhere, just cruising <laughs> along at the wrong time, wrong, wrong place yeah. at the wrong time, so it's perfectly like, timed. Yeah. yeah, and and the fact that he had gone about what a hundred miles away on the car, then another yeah. probably ten miles by kite surf to be on another bit of ice, yeah. which is completely away from anything else, and yet he manages to get back on a skidoo, which randomly yeah. was there. But anyway, it, it's a, yeah, it's great. Um, so yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely Golden Eye and Die Another Day. And with the other two, it's interesting. They've chopped, they've like chopped and changed for me. Um, yeah, I, th- I, I, I feel overall, the same about those two. Overall, I uh, well, I don't know. Uh, the world is not enough. I think has got a really strong villain in Electric King. She's class. Um, yeah, I think I think there's a there's a lot of good and bad in both of those. Like yeah. I think um, again, I haven't seen Tomorrow Never Dies in a while, but I kind of I like. Um, I think the idea of Elliot Carver was cool. Like you know, the media baron. That's like a classic Bond villain. Mm. I don't think he quite pulled it off though. I think the the idea of what he could have been. Is, is great you know the yeah. media baron who's manipulating events to, to, to fuel his own ends I think that's great that's class but there was just something about that that wasn't he didn't step up into that group of classic villains for me I don't know it's just no, I agree, a bit yeah. flat on that um, Stamper was like you know a try a, trying to be henchman you know but it just didn't didn't feel right for me it was you know you got the different coloured eyes and the no pain and all that kind of stuff but again he's just a bit sort of generic there's nothing really that memorable about him you know yeah um uh like uh why lynn again she was cool we we haven't really seen like a, a martial arts kick-ass kind of bond girl so I, she's got that going mm. for her but again i don't know there's just something about it where a lot of that kind of falls a bit flat and i don't know whether that was the direction i know there was a lot of troubles in the actual production of that movie so i don't know whether that was problems that that arose throughout that i don't know but um yeah i don't know I, for me i think t- uh, tomorrow never dies is the weaker of the of the middle two mm. um simply because world is not enough has got that great boat chase which i think is, is cool that's like an iconic one that will go down yeah. in history um it's got um you know electric king which i think is great um and and yeah but both of them have, they've got some some serious downsides as well um you know, Christmas Jones wasn't particularly well cast in my view, um, and yeah, it's just there's just some sort of silliness in there, you know, um, and some really cheesy dialogue as well. So I think for me, in, in, yeah. if I'm going to rank them all in order in the four, it will be Golden Eye, World Is Not Enough, Tomorrow Never Dies, Die Another Day. I agree with you. There we are. Nice. On this t- is going well, man. I feel, yeah. I feel this is good. Yeah, all right, I cool. Know. So that's Pierce put to bed, tucked in. Now let's get on to uh, the man of the moment, old Danny Boy. What do you think? Well, I absolutely think he is rubbish. I think he's so bad at playing Bond. He, I can't believe why he was chosen. And I've just been talking bollocks for the last 10 seconds because that man is awesome. <laughs> he... <laughs> He, 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 I was I was beginning to suspect whether you were the guy that set up the Craigie's Not Bond dot com website to like translate him. But you know, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. No, he's he's. I mean, he's great. He's he's tough. He's he's got a good look to him. You know, he's he's the biggest Bond in terms of sort of bulk. You can know he could handle himself. I think the films he's had have been very good, in particular. Um, well, but of all of them really, and I don't think Quantum's quite as bad as a lot of people say, but that's that's something for later on. Um, but yeah, no, he's he's fantastic. The look, I mean, the Casino Royale. He's driving. He gets in the Aston Martin DBS. He's driving on the road, chasing after Vesper Lind, and there's a camera shot on him driving, and he's got the blue steely eyes. He's got one hand on the steering wheel. He's in his dinner jacket suit. He's in an Aston Martin, and I'm, you know, you can picture pause that, and you're like, that is. You know that and Connery, Doctor No, is the same sort of level for me. Do like, you know what? That's funny. You should say that. Actually, I know. I know that that sh- camera shot that you're talking about, and you're absolutely right. There's also a bit at the very beginning in the in the fight in the toilet, um, yeah. where like he's just throwing the guy on the floor, and he's just sort of like like sort of catching his breath. And there's a camera where he's kind of just looking down at the guy on the on the on the floor. And if you pause that, 
it's almost like looking at classic Connery. Like there's just this camera angle that he just gets it in that second. Um, yeah, I, like for me, this this is my story of, of how this happened, right? Hmm. Um, it must have been 2005 they did the press conference and I remember praying that all the rumours that it was him going to be Bond. Um, I think like the main two players at the time, it's certainly in all the press, which you can take with a pinch of salt, was either Clive Owen or Daniel Craig. And I remember thinking, well, I don't really want either of these guys because Clive Owen's got a really, really monotonous voice. Um, yeah. But he's sort of roughly got the look, or there's Daniel Craig. So I was thinking, well, a lesser of two evils would be Clive Owen. But I'm still yeah. not happy with that. He turns up on the boat, and I remember literally facing hands going, no, <laughs> what have they done? No. <laughs> and then watching the press conference, and bless his heart, he must have been a bit like shell-shocked of all the attention. Um, he just sort of was uh, giving the wrong answers to everything, you know. Yeah. It was like, you know, why do you want to play Bond? And he was like, why not? I remember him answering that and being like, come on, man, like, say something, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I, I, rem- I decided that it was just like, this is just, this is going to be a disaster. Um, like that first production still I was like oh he sort of looks alright but like you know that was the the shot of him holding the gun and stuff yeah. in the suit um, and again like when I went to see it it was just so different I just did not know what to feel I was mm. like, and I was still hung up on his visuals at that point it's like you know that bit in, in Madagascar at the beginning and it's all yeah. like he's very blonde looks very sunburnt and it's just like this is just I'm not I'm not I can't I don't know what to feel about this um, and then like I say, I watched it, came back the next day and watched it again and was just like, actually, this is the best Bond film I have ever seen. They have got it so right. And it's just like, because of that shock of it being so different, that was all that first viewing was, was just like, this is, I don't know what to do with this. Mm. And then you watch it again, it was like, this is incredible. And like, there's something about him where I don't think we've had it since Sean, in the sense that Sean had that like animal magnetism of like, you know, he doesn't give a fuck about it anybody and he's just just like he can handle himself in any situation um whereas the other guys not so much but then daniel you know he could literally take out a room full of dudes should the need arise you know it's a it's a good good need to have that i think yeah that's completely true he's uh he brings that to the scale and spades and uh yeah, I mean, I was I'm along the same lines of you in terms of when it was sort of announced as one of the possibilities. I didn't really know a lot about him. I'd seen Munich and I thought that was good. Road to Perdition, yeah. and that was a good film. Um, but, you know, I didn't know a lot about him. Didn't really, I hadn't considered him. Clive Owen, actually, yeah. like in terms of look, I thought, wow, he, he's he's got a Bond look. He could be good. And then I saw, yeah. and then I was never sure about some of the films that he'd done, but... um. Yeah, I think that's part of the reason why Casino Royale might have been even more, you know, even as amazing as it was, is because some people didn't have that expectation. Maybe because everyone was thinking, well, we're not sure about here, we're not sure about this film. Obviously, that fueled the filmmakers and fueled. Uh, I think, uh, I, yeah, I, I think with that, there's, 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 there's definitely a role to play in that, but I think. The main thing for me with th- with that is that just the film was amazing. They just got everything so right with that, and it's it's just that's the thing that sort of blew me away. And I suppose in the sense that we were all going in expecting him to be rubbish, but then, but just the source material was just so bang on, and the tone was so right that it was just it was just amazing. It was just great. I think like for me and I, I don't quite know how they pulled this off, is that the most iconic line in all of cinema, which is the name is Bond, James Bond, um, how they freshened that up and delivered it in a new way, in the way they did, I was just not expecting that at all. But it's, sadly enough, I remember seeing the, the track listing for the soundtrack before the film came out, and the yeah. last track on that album was the name is Bond, James Bond. And I was like, oh, fuck, that means he's probably going to say the line at the very end. Like, And, of course, it was all a reboot and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I've got, I'll be honest with you, Chris, nothing in life excites me as much as that final scene in Casino Royale. Like, Mr. White stood there on the on the front, and it's like, uh, phone rings, hello. Mr. White, we need to talk. You hear the whoop of the bullet. He falls on his knees. He's crawling along. And then just you get that shot, and then you just get the music creep in. And you yeah. see Daniel's foot come in the shot, and he just calmly walks up the stairs. Camera sweeps up, 
and it's like and he says the line and I'm getting chills just talking about it now like every time I talk about it I get chills because it's so fucking brilliant you know what I mean it's just just so good um, and it's like after that moment I just want to leap in the air and just make noise do you know what I mean it's just so bang on the money um, and I don't th- I can't think of, of many certainly not many other scenes in any of the other Bond movies that gives me that reaction like every time I talk about that my I chills head to toe because it's just so brilliant um, and the the thing in terms of the humour I feel that one of the things I had wrong with Skyfall is that the one liners to me were, were like they felt forced you know there's the bit where in the casino where it's, he's like yeah, I can't remember what he, what he even says now he's like circle of life as he walks off and it was like that's not mm. really funny Daniel you know, yeah. don't bother you know and I feel like his bond is that isn't his bond and it doesn't I don't feel like that quite works for him um, and the, you know I, I fell into some deep water just just feel like just annoys me in the same way like that Pierce's one liners annoy me sometimes in those those last three movies. But um like all the stuff, the humour in Casino Royale is so on the money, it's incredible. Like, you know, the last hand nearly killed me. That's just so good. Yeah. And the thing about, you know, um vodka martini, do I look like a give a damn and then yeah. everyone else is like, Oh yeah, I have one of those, I have one of those and it's just like it's just so good. It's classy humour, it's clever humour. Um but yeah uh, for me just everything about Casino Royale is just bang on the money uh, I completely and utterly agree I think it's the best wow well, it's, uh, it's I think it uh, that's the biggest buzz I've had going to the cinema and watching a film was after seeing that I think the opening scene with the parkour and the cranes yeah. uh, literally oh, yeah. my yeah. mouth was open My like everyone in the cinema was just that you know it's jaw dropping stuff it was amazing yeah. and I remember I mean there's so many good scenes so many good scenes but I remember seeing it I saw it quite a few times and I remember seeing it one screening and there were a couple of guys you know young scallywags and uh, there was a scene where um, Le Chief is bond sort of naked and strapped to the chair and they were kind of laughing and trying to make pranks saying oh look isn't this a bit gay and everything like that yeah and then as soon as like Le Chief hit him with the with the uh, cat of nine tails and Bond's reaction to scratch his balls, yeah. they just shut up. They yeah. were, they just shut up because they knew that what they were watching was the best thing they'd ever seen in their lives. Yeah, and yeah. they went from being all this sort of yeah yeah whatever to fuck me. This is like one of the best yeah. scenes I've ever seen. And that for me was great because it just shows the power of Bond and how good that yeah. film is. And it wasn't just that scene, there were lots of scenes like that. And yeah. the dinner jacket scene, love it, love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Th- again, like you're talking like that and here I am head to toe in chills again, just like I yeah. can't help it. That just there's so many good things about it. Like for me, there's there's so many sequences. I think I love all the Bahamas stuff. I think that's brilliant. That's like classic Bond location. It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, there's, um, there's, yeah, there's all that stuff, the card game, winning the car and all that kind of stuff. And um, and just, just all that stuff is so bang on. And I think like when you get towards the end and you've got the, the card game, I'm like, how do you make a card game interesting on film? Like, how do you keep that tension up? Because that could easily be the bit where everybody goes, oh, it gets a bit slow at the card game. Yeah. But it doesn't. Like, them just sitting there facing each other off and, like, staring each other out over the cards is just bang on. And I don't know how they achieved that. Obviously, there's the bits where they, they break for a few hours and he'll go upstairs and have yeah. a fight, you know, in, in the stairwell. That's a wicked fight, by the way. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and uh, and all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's just I, I mean... At the risk of sounding like I'm in love with the film, <laughs> I absolutely am on every level, and I just I, oh now I'm, I might have just changed my mind. Maybe this is my favourite Bond, and OHMSS has just gone into number two. I, I just I can't I I can't say enough good things about this movie. The performances, the theme song is amazing. Like the yeah. lyrics of that tune are so perfect, it's great, and that, that's one of the things I loved about it. In the sense that with a lot of like the the well. I was going to say a lot of the Pierce films, but I think when you go back, probably the last, the previous twenty odd years, it feels like the songs. A lot of the songs were just there because they were fashionable people at the time, you know. And yeah, especially Madonna. I mean, that that song was just phoned in. It was like something she had lying around in a drawer somewhere, and she just changed the title of it, and that was that. Oh, yeah. But that song was written for the film, and it just fits it so perfectly. And I remember, again, that was another thing. When that song came out and I heard it on the radio, obviously way before the film came out, I was like, 
what are they doing? Like, this is, that's not Bond. Like, what's going on? It's too <laughs> guitar-y and raucous. But yeah. then it fits it so well. And, like, you know, those, you know, you got the Jack White song as well for Quantum. Like, they, they, they were just different again, but still within the realms of, of, of a Bond song. I just... I, I'm going to shut up now because I've been rambling on for ages and you haven't been able to say a word. So I'm just going to be quiet and I'm going to try not to butt in, but I don't promise anything because I love it so much. Go okay. on, you, you talk for a bit, man. I'm going to stay quiet. All right, you go and grab a, grab a coffee or something. No, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, Casino Royale, we obviously will need to have a whole podcast for that film because... Yeah, maybe maybe even two or three. Maybe even two or three because it's just too much good stuff going on. Um with with Danny Boy, you know, he's done the three. Everyone's, I think, pretty well, actually, it's not sure. Skyfall's had a lot of good, good sort of reaction. You know, a lot of people love that. Quantum's had quite a lot of bad reaction. Um, Skyfall, when I first saw it, I almost, well, I wanted to, in fact, did I? I don't know. I know that was Quantum. I know both coming out of seeing Quantum and coming out of seeing Skyfall, I wasn't I re- happy either. I remember both of those times. I remember going to see Quantum and I remember seeing that you'd posted on Facebook, oh my God, they got it so right last time. How could they get it so wrong this time? And I remember phoning you up the night before I went to see it going, oh no, is it that bad? And you were like, I'm not telling you anything, just go and see, see it and we'll see what you think. And then um, with Skyfall, obviously we, what we did is we got a group of us together and we went to the, like a charity premiere in Cardiff yeah. and we all watched it together. Um, all in uh, with bow ties on and, and all the rest of it we, we went full full on for that one um, but yeah it was the same for me I watched Skyfall and I I just I just I really did, I really wasn't happy with it and I must admit like it has grown on me since mm. but there's I'm still like there's still something not quite right about that film for me I, I don't know quite how you feel I know you like it a lot more a, a then, lot yeah. more now yeah a lot more I think there are certain things like sort of CGI bits and what have you which I've almost had to learn to uh, blank out of my mind when I'm watching yeah. it because they're not good but it's you know some of the scenes when he's training and, and when he's with the doctor and, and all that I think I think it's fantastic um, the you know the fight against um uh, you know, in Shanghai with the with the guns and the shadow sort of shadow fight, yeah. I really like that. Yeah, that was um, cool. There's a there is a lot going for it. There's a lot. There are one or two things. The thing with Casino Royale is there's nothing really that's wrong with it. I'd say the only thing that is probably wrong with it is the exposure to product placement, which is in the film. Which yeah. isn't all yeah. the way through, but there are instances where you're like, oh, not I, sure think, about I that. think that's got worse in recent times, isn't it? Because it's always been there. Like, I remember with Goldeneye, do you remember in the tank chase, there's that big truck of Perrier water Pe- bottles yeah. that comes into shot. And that, to me, that's like, it's, it's subtle is the wrong word, because that's not subtle at all, but no. you can forgive that. Yeah. What it kind of <laughs> grinds my gears is like, oh, that's a beautiful watch. And it, come on, like we know what's going on there. Yeah. Like, don't be, don't insult us with that shit. Yeah, you um, don't need to do that. You don't need. And to then do that. you know, in Skyfall, you got that bit at the beginning where Money Penny's on the thing, and she's like, "VW Beatles." Like, who has it ever said that? Yeah, do you I mean, know what I mean? In, and you didn't you need w- to anyway because it was yeah. obvious, wasn't it? But yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but aside from that, you know, that's only a small thing. Um, and then yeah, so uh, Casino Royale, without a doubt favorite uh favorite daniel craig film i think skyfall is definitely a lot better than than when i first saw it uh quantum has also improved for me it's not not a patch on the other two but the thing that really annoyed me about that was basically the script obviously wasn't finished and they decided to to shoot and there's the story's a bit lacking um and again the cgi bits in that which are really really frustrating but it has a lot. It has some really good bits going for it, and I I didn't actually mind the villain. You know, I know a lot of people weren't sure about him, particularly the fight at the end. But I thought he was I thought he was all right, and uh, I like uh, the scene um, at the opera. I thought was probably the best scene in the whole film. That and the car chase at the start were both. Yeah, do you know what? I I agree totally. I think for me that opera scene is is like a classic Bond setting, and I I like what that is as well. Like what's actually happening there. He's, he's using that as a clever way to like flush them all out so he can see the faces of the of the quantum group as they leave you know um yeah that's awesome like there's, there's a lot of that that like there's do you remember there's that bit in golden eye at the beginning where he's he's down in um 
Monaco and there's that weird sort of like mime thing going on in that yeah. weird outdoor theatre and when he gets up and he uses the monocle to spy on the boat um, there's something about those like weird operatic things and I'm sure that happens a couple of times in Rogers films as well where there's just something something weird like that going on in the background yeah. of the setting and I, I, for some reason I don't know I can't put it into words I, lo- I like that kind of thing it adds a bit um, of class to it doesn't it yeah Definitely. I guess that's what it does yeah um, again I was I was disappointed with it I mean like it felt to me again I, I got a bad feeling of it just from the trailer because it was like the trailer was just just balls out action and it was mm. like Bond on a bike Bond in a car Bond in a boat Bond in a plane and it was just like where else can we put Bond to make some action and it was just like yeah. you know that plane sequence with the, the the parachute jump and all that kind of stuff it was just like oh, it's too much you know mm. it's too much but under the circumstances of what they were dealing with at the time it was literally making it up as they went along so what else is it going to be? It's not going to be up there with anything else because that's all it is, you know. And if yeah. you take it in the context of that it's basically just a revenge movie, then then it's all right. But recently I did watch Casino back to back with Quantum. And for me, I was hoping that would make me think Quantum was better, but the difference between the two is so glaring. Like yeah. even in the cinematography, it's like that weird shaky cam and the editing. Mm. It's like you can't see what the hell is going on in Quantum mm. in that car chase. No. Whereas Casino is so beautifully filmed. It's just mm. it's those huge sh- like wide shots on the free running sequence and stuff at the beginning. It's all great. And again, you can't argue with the cinematography in Skyfall either. I mean, it, it's visually it's, amazing. Oh, it's lovely. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, Quantum is what it is, I think. And I, I think, you know, there's some, there's some good things, but ultimately it's, it's kind of, it is a letdown in comparison to what it, what it could have been, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, I th- Casino is always going to be my favourite. Um, and then Quantum in second position, Skyfall in third. Oh. No, you put Quantum ahead of no, Skyfall. No, sorry, I got that confused. <laughs> I take that back. <laughs> I take it back. Casino in first, Skyfall second, oh, Quantum okay. in third. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, sounds good, sounds good. And go on. So there we go. Mm. I think like, w- well, basically for the benefit of our listeners, what we did is we drew, we drew up a, a list of like five or six questions that we were going to kind of cover and chat about. Um, and we had a sneaky suspicion that we would, we would be discussing each of the Bond actors and that would probably take us by about four hours worth of chit chat. And that's pretty much what we've done, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. So I think, I don't know how you feel, I think this is probably a good place to, uh, to call it a day for, for episode one. What yeah. do you think? I think it's perfect timing, about 90 minutes or so. You know. Okay, cool. That's wicked then. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to release a new episode once a month, towards the end of each month. Um, and uh, I was thinking what would be good if we'd have actually been prepared enough to actually do it is to have a little bit at the end and say, James Bond Radio will return with, like they do at the end of the movies, at the end of the credits. But that means we have to decide on a subject matter for the next episode so we can say what that is. Oh, I reckon an interesting one was one of the questions we had. What do we want to see at a Bond 24? Okay, that's good. Okay, so that is a great question. So we're going to kick things off. So I'm going to, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say that's all for today. And James Bond Radio will return with what we want to see from Bond 24. I've been Tom Sears. I've been Chris Wright. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.